Today we're going to talk about advanced grown materials. Advanced grown means that they're not cultivated in a traditional way in a field, but they're grown using microorganisms such as yeast, or fungi, or bacteria, and they're grown in labs and factories. Doing this, we can produce materials such as uh, bacterial cellulose or the mycelium that many of you may already know. However, today we're going to talk to somebody who knows how to use these microorganisms in a very special way. He's going to talk about how we can use synthetic biology to grow high value materials. And what is really cool about the way that they work is that they do not just use uh, bacteria, and yeasts, which are typically used in the processes for synthetic biology, they also use algae. And algae is really cool because unlike yeast and bacteria, it doesn't need feeding with sugars. It uh, runs on sunlight and at the same time it absorbs carbon dioxide. So one of the things he's going to talk about is how we can use algae as biocell factories. My name is Birger Lindberg Müller. I'm professor in plant biochemistry at the Plant Biochemistry Laboratory here at the University of Copenhagen. I've been working here for about more than 40 years and my hobby is actually plants and how they communicate with their environment. I'm studying as an organic chemist. I was interested in medicinal plants from Africa. My advisor was from Ghana and we were isolating these compounds. And since then I've been interested in how these natural products are used by plants. We know them from some plants where we call them medicinal plants because we actually use these compounds to treat diseases. But uh, the plants use them for other purposes, of course to deter herbivores and pests, but also to communicate with other plants. And this communication I feel is really interesting. Synthetic biology is a third generation genetic engineering and synthetic biology involves work with modules in plants. And in our work, we find out how these different modules work. So synthetic biology, you should respect nature and work with nature in doing these things. So it's to substitute um, other production forms. I'm a plant biochemist, so of course I love plants. But the good thing about plants as a production system is that you use carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and you use solar energy. And you can produce many of these molecules also in yeast cells. But these cells you need to feed with sort of organic material like sugars. And that means you are not sort of, you, you are producing and isolating those sugars and that demands the release of carbon dioxide. So we want to make this an opposite procedure where you actually consume carbon dioxide when you, when you produce. The reason people are using yeast now is very, very good because yeast has been used like in the brewing industry for 10,000 years. So we can get much higher yields when you used yeast. So in the plant system, for these to be competitive, it will take another 10, 15 years. But so this is a long term investment. Some of the investments are already coming through now, but the general large scale production as long as we have a tax system as we have now, where there's no higher taxes on fossil fuels, then you need to produce high value molecules here because it's costly and slow. So if you change the tax system, CO2 tax and so on, then you favor automatically sort of the competitivity uh, that you produce using light and, and CO2 instead of uh, fossil fuels or uh, uh, is much better in yeast than fossil fuels, but still you would like to be independent on, on, on land and, uh, to, and you don't want to use fossil fuels. When we uh, want to use synthetic biology in photosynthetic cells, our aim is really to move all the processes into the chloroplast, the powerhouse. This is because the, the chloroplast is a very, very strong production unit. And in addition to doing photosynthesis, they produce amino acids and terpene starting materials so that the starting materials to do synthetic biology are already made in the chloroplast. So when you introduce the genes, you want to make your final products, the starting the substrates for the enzymes encoded by the genes, they are already there. In the lab, we use tobacco as a quick test system. We can infiltrate the tobacco plant with a soil bacterium, acrobacterium, and that will sort of uh, get the genes expressed. We want to test if they are doing the right job. 
So the genes would be transcribed into RNA, which would then be trans translated into proteins, which would encode the formation. We do a lot of uh, studies here to find out how plants survive. They cannot move around like humans or animals. When we are threatened, you just run away. If there's no food where you are, they have to produce from the site, same site their entire life cycle. In our research, we focus on producing high value materials, compounds which are in demand by the general public. And we focus on the high value molecules because biological production is costly. We cannot compete with production from the chemical industry based on fossil fuels. So in the future, when our production facilities improve, we get higher and higher yields, we can make cheaper and cheaper molecules and still outcompete fossil industries. But this has, we're talking about 10, 15 years horizon. One of the molecules we looked at was carmine. This is the red pigment, which you find in many different products. If you have red Nike shoes, uh, they are colored with carmine. If you eat red sausages, the dress of the Pope is a carmine stained dress. The reason you find the, the Inca clothes is so well preserved is that they're stained with carmine. So that's a very, very stable molecule. Also, when you drink Campari, you get carmine. So the reason this molecule is stable is that um, it has a sugar molecule that is bound in a very, very unusual way, in a linkage, a chemical linkage, which is very difficult to cleave. So that makes the molecule very stable. So when we found out what kind of enzymes does that, you can make other pigments now more stable than the, those you find in nature. So the carmine is actually produced from a scale insect. The female insect produces uh, this, uh, this carmine, and we don't actually know why the insect produces these immense amounts, whether to protect her or, or communicate or, or why. But it's, uh, the insects are, are being uh, put, uh, they grow in Peru, in South America, and um, they, when you collect the scale insects from the cacti, the poncia cacti they grow on, they are completely white, but then when you remove the wax, you see a red body in below that white skin. And this is what we extract to get the carmine. So vegetarians would not like products with carmine because it's actually made from an animal. And now we figured out how these scale insects produce these molecules, and then we transfer these, these processes to fungi and yeast, and then you can produce again low amounts, but this is a sort of investment to optimize the production system before this becomes sort of uh, competitive. Another value, high value uh, aroma compound uh, is actually vanillin, the vanilla aroma. And people know that you, when you buy the vanilla pot, it's fermented and black, and you pay quite a lot of money for it. Actually, the kilo price for good vanilla pots is the same as the price of gold, because there's been many diseases and low yields. So the vanilla part comes from the vanilla orchid. So the orchid flowers and uh, the flower opens in the morning and it withers already in early afternoon. And there are no natural pollinators outside Mexico. So each flower has to be hand pollinated. And that's one of the reasons the vanilla part is so costly. Uh, in the vanilla part, you have more than 200 different flavor molecules and it's costly. So when you buy vanilla sugar, it typically has nothing to do with the vanilla orchid. So the vanilla part provides a maximum 3% of the vanilla aroma used in the world. The rest is coming from oil or from boiling uh, wood with sulfuric acid. And these are really polluting technologies and, and that's why producing this in yeast or in a green system would be much more environmental uh, benign. So we actually managed to produce the main compound that's vanillin glucoside and we have produced that in, in ton scale. So it's actually, it is possible to upscale these processes. This upscaling was done in yeast and not in plants as I said because that's where the yield is high and we can be competitive. So with the, with the uh, Vanlin project, we managed to make the main aroma compound in ton scale, and it has been commercialized. And when you uh, see the bottle and, and you smell, it's really, really nice. It ranks very high, even though it's one, only the main vanilla component we have here. So this biological process, there's something else in the product, which we really don't know, probably coming from the yeast, which really augments the flavor and, and the mouthfeel. 
So we could also have been unhappy that you would have gotten something giving an off flavor, but, but this is really, uh, we, are, we, are, we are quite proud of, of, of that success. So in the lab, we are only working small scale. But really what we are up to is to have large scale production. And there are companies now setting up large scale systems, not based actually on synthetic biology, but making uh, by growing algae. And then the products you can get from the algae, you can make biscuits or whatever, or you can make uh, colorants uh, if they produce a yellow carotenoid, or orange pigment and so on. So this can be done already now. This is from uh, Nova Green, a company uh, in Berlin, and they grow these algae in plastic uh, bags. They are 40 liters uh, volume, and uh, you can produce actually quite a lot of algae mass. And when these are engineered to make high value molecules, then that's the production system we imagine. Our test system, which is in Tostrup, uh, with, with the Institute of Technology, looks like this, where you have a tubular system where you can pump the algae through and you can harvest and uh, you can also grow photosynthetic cells there or mast cells and then have that as a production unit. The issue is that the yields, as I said, are very, very small right now. But if you want to use algae collected different places in nature, you can make uh, carotenoids, yellow pigment, red pigments, and this is uh, in a business uh, already. So the handling technology up, I mean, purification of the molecules is being established. And for instance, um, this algae dome was made by, uh, in, in here in Copenhagen, and uh, the biology garage, it's a do-it-yourself community, was involved in making this together with other, other um, uh, researchers. And this is just showing how you can have a production unit in your garden or in a glass house. Actually, it's not very difficult uh, to make. Then uh, you can use kelp and you can make a yarn from that, so you can do knitting. And again, you can color those, uh, those fibers in a natural way. So it's again, instead of having cotton fields, uh, which take up a lot of space and a lot of water, then you harvest the kelp from the water and uh, you have a sustainable uh, production uh, system. This is how it looks in the lab, small scale jars, flasks, and then when we, when we have this working, then you can start to incubate the big uh, bioreactors and then get the up uh, scaling uh, running. In the past, when you look at the opium biosynthesis, how are these compounds made, how are these drugs made, it took like generations, 40 years of research period. Now we can do that in one or two years. So that means that the cost of getting this, these systems up and running are much, much reduced. Likewise, when I started as a bachelor student, we were isolating medicinal compounds from 20 kilos of bark from African medicinal plants. Now you start with a leaf disc of nine, nine millimeter and you can get the same information. So the technologies are really, really has changed a lot. And that's, for instance, uh, the mass spectrometry. So you have systems where you can effectively, uh, very efficiently separate the compounds you have in your extracts and you can do exact masses and you can find out what are the molecules from mass spectrometry or in a mass spectroscopy. So, so it's a complete different situation today than just 10 years ago.